Well, good evening, Corvallis. And wherever you are listening to this uh, STEAM series lecture from, welcome to another da virtual Da Vinci Days uh, talk on a warm summer day in the Willamette Valley. My name is Nick Houtman. I'm a member of the Da Vinci Days Board of Directors. Now, as you may know, Da Vinci Days has been celebrating the creative energy of this community for more than 30 years. And in this year of the pandemic, we've moved all of our festivities online and into neighborhoods. Last month, uh, families were joining the Kids Kinetic Challenge, decorating their bikes, doing figure eights and other activities at home. This month, uh, we're inviting kids to families to join us for the Sidewalk Chalk Art Challenge and share their activities with pictures and videos. We're going to also be planning, be planning a uh, series of online concerts starting in about a week. So uh, go to davincidays.org or the Da Vinci Days Facebook page to see what's coming up the next week or two. If you're looking for fun things to do with your family or just exciting things to keep that creative energy alive. A few thank yous in order before we get going with our presentation tonight. Uh, our sponsors have stepped up this year to help us keep Da Vinci Days free and accessible to the public, even though we're not having our usual face-to-face uh, festival at the Benton County Fairgrounds. Uh, we are doing all of the online work and, and other work that keeps Da Vinci Days going. So the city of Corvallis, Benton County, HP and Corvus have uh, stepped up to help us out this year and we very much appreciate their support. And I'd also like to thank a couple of people behind the scenes, uh, Ben Potter, our uh, tech assistant and producer and uh, Carol Hobrock, our executive director who is monitoring the questions and comments on Facebook. So welcome again. Uh, as you may know, the STEAM series is all about creativity and science, technology, engineering, art, and math, thus the acronym STEAM. And this year our theme is IGNITE, and we've been talking uh, about the nature of fire. We've been talking about augmented reality and music. Tonight we're taking a look at Oregon's forests. This is our science presentation. Claire Tortorelli is a PhD student in the College of Forestry at Oregon State University. She happens to study the intersection of two things that affect our forests, fire and invasive species. She uh, grew up in Champaign, Illinois, and she has a bachelor's degree in forestry from Colorado State. Uh, she spent some years, as she says, botanizing didn't know botanize was a, a verb, but botanizing across the West. Maybe she'll share a little bit more about exactly what she did there. Uh, she's broadly interested in how plant communities respond to and influence the disturbances that inevitably happen in our forests and other communities, uh, in uh, natural communities. In Meg Krawchuk's lab at Oregon State, uh, Claire studies the dynamics of Ventanata dubia, uh, non-native annual grass in the forests and rangelands uh, of, of Eastern Oregon. By the way, say that quickly about five times, Ventanata dubia. She can uh, often be found, she says, with a hand lens at the ready because she says you never know what you might stumble upon that deserves a closer look. So with that, I'd like to welcome Claire to, to the Da Vinci Day stage. Claire, please go ahead and take it away from here. Thanks, Nick. Pull up. Yeah, thanks, Nick, and thanks everyone for coming out today. I just want to share a little bit about my research on invasive plants and in fire in Oregon. So I want to start us off talking a little bit about the balance of fuels and fire and hopefully what's a familiar ecosystem to many of us Oregonians. Um, so here is a what might be a familiar scene, a low severity fire burning through the understory of a ponderosa pine forest. So as this fire kind of creeps along the understory here, it's burning a lot of the grass, might kill the shrubs and many of the small trees, but leaves most of these large thick barked ponderosa pine trees alive. And frequent fires, Frequent low severity fires like this one are really important for keeping this open structure in the forest and for maintaining ecosystem functions that go along with those open forest ecosystems. 
However, about 100 years of fire suppression in this area have allowed many of the small trees and shrubs to start infilling the areas in this understory, which has increased the fuels. So you imagine we have, before we had these sparse, sparsely vegetated kind of um, scattered shrubs and small trees, and now if they're infilling in the understory, when a, when a fire does start, one that we're not able to put out, it's likely to look less like this and more like this. So we're seeing more and more uncharacteristic high severity fires in these dry mixed conifer forests, some, some of even these ponderosa pine forests. And fires like this, um, they're much hotter and they're able to kill a lot of those large trees more easily. And that can really change how the ecosystem functions. Um, and so this is kind of a story of fuel and fire, the balance of fuel and fire in ponderosa pine forests. But there are other ways that fuels that the balance can be upset. So fire suppression isn't the only way that fuels can increase in a forest. And for the rest of the presentation, I'll be focusing on another way that fuels can increase, so plant invasions and how they might alter fuels and fire. So I wanna bring us over to the Great Basin, so kind of the Nevada region, um, where this is a familiar site. So I see these vast landscapes of scattered large um, shrubs, big sagebrush. And if you look at this photo closely, you can see that while we have those scattered shrubs, in between those shrubs, there's a lot of bare ground. And on that bare ground, there's some bunch grasses, aptly named for their kind of bunchy characteristic. Um, but there's not much else in the way of fuels. And so you can imagine that if a fire were to ignite in this system, it might burn one or two shrubs, maybe a small patch, but it's going to leave the landscape relatively unburned, um, burning under kind of normal fire conditions. So you might get a patch of burned area, leaving a lot of the surrounding sagebrush unaffected because the fire was stopped by that bare ground where there are no fuels to carry it into the surrounding um, sagebrush. And leaving that area unburned is really important for this ecosystem. The sagebrush recovers very slowly after fire. It doesn't re-sprout like many shrub species and it requires a seed source um, to either survive the fire, which is sort of rare, or to be transported into the fire, um, into the burned area, which is more common. And the seeds don't transport very far. So it's really important to have sagebrush that's unburned, that's close to the burned area in order to kind of, for these areas to recover to their pre-fire state. But what we're seeing more common in these areas is an invasion of cheat grass, which is an annual grass. Um, it's the red and gold foliage in this photo that really is filling in the understory of these sagebrush ecosystems and transforming what was before a lot of bare ground and scattered bunch grasses to like a carpet of grassy fine fuels. And you can imagine now that if a fire lit in this ecosystem, that, that cheat grass is gonna act more like a conveyor belt carrying fire from shrub to shrub. So instead of patchy fires, we might get fires that look more like this, with large landscapes of many shrubs burning, leaving large areas of burned ground and few surviving sagebrush to reseed those areas. And that can really alter the ecosystem function here. So if we lose those deep rooted sagebrush species from this site, um, that can alter things like hydraulic cycling, nutrient cycling. It can impact habitat for species that rely on sagebrush, um, which can, again, alter those ecosystem functions. And, in, and instead, you might just have a lot of cheatgrass, which has different properties. So although um, all invasive plants serve as some sort of fuel provided there's a fire, grasses are particularly prone to altering fuels and are particularly problematic for fires, um, especially annual grasses for a couple of reasons. And one of those reasons is because they grow really fast and they produce a lot of seeds, which allows them to spread very quickly. Um, another reason is because of just their structure. They're this tiny flimsy grass that has kind of a lot of air. Um, we call that it has a lot of air where it grows, so it allows the, the wind to kind of blow the fire through and allows that fire to spread more easily than if it was kind of a dense, densely packed plant there. And the final reason, um, well, there are many reasons, but another reason, a really important reason, is because annual grasses tend to recover very quickly after fire. They can, they can be up to their pre-fire cover in a year or two after fire. Um, which is, cannot be said for many native species. 
And this can cause kind of a grass fire cycle where you have cheatgrass um, or another annual grass that helps promote the burning in these ecosystems. And then after the burn, the grass comes in um, or some of the seeds survive and increases those fine grassy fuels again in this ecosystem. And you get this, this cycle of grass and fire and more grass and more fire that's really difficult to break. And these grass fire cycles are pretty common across the West, unfortunately. We've seen invasions of cheatgrass, like I said, in the cold deserts of the Great Basin, those blue areas on the map um, around here. We have closely related species such as red brome invading and causing grass fire cycles in the warm deserts of the Southwest. And a mix of annual grasses doing the same thing in the California Mediterranean regions. But a lot of our ecosystems have remained relatively resistant to annual grasses and their impacts. Um, one area we'll be focusing on is the Blue Mountain ecoregion of northeastern Oregon here. And in this forest, mixed forest and shrubland region, um, we've had relatively little impact from invasion, annual, invasion of annual grasses in the past. And one reason that um, and one reason that these areas might be resistant is because they're kind of outside the environmental and community tolerances of the annual grasses that are present. So cheatgrass and deuce ahead and kind of a mix of those annual bromes. Um, and the tolerances for annual grasses kind of range across the spectrum. So the figure here I have um, on the x-axis, we have increasing or just a variation of different ecosystems from warm dry deserts on the bottom left to cold moist mountain sagebrush regions on the um, bottom right. <clears throat> and on the y-axis, we see increasing resistance to cheatgrass. This indicates that communities are kind of more or less susceptible to being invaded by cheatgrass. It's low from low going to high. And you can see this, um, we have kind of a curve on this graph indicating that these warm, dry areas are pretty resistant to cheatgrass. And then we kind of have a dip in those great basin sagebrush regions we saw earlier, and then increasing resistance again in the cold moist regions. And one reason for that is because in these warm dry areas, there's just not very much water and cheatgrass really needs water to establish. So we say this is kind of a resource limited ecosystem. Cheatgrass can't do very well here. It doesn't have the resources it needs. On the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of water in this cold moist ecosystem. But because there's so much native vegetation, um, even though that water might be present, it's being used up by the native species. So there's a lot of competition here. So that also decreases the resources available to cheatgrass. But in the middle in the great sagebrush um, ecosystems, it's kind of it's just enough, just enough resources, just little enough competition for cheatgrass to really take over. But a disturbance such as fire can lower community resistance in all of these ecosystems. So in the hot dry site, um, you might get a fire that burns through some of these shrubs, increasing resources, um, nutrients where the fire burned and providing a little area for cheatgrass to be established. And the same um, is pretty much true for the cold moist areas where instead of, we're also increasing resources by decreasing competition. And while this is the ecosystem kind of gradient of resistance for cheatgrass, a new invasive species might have different environmental tolerances. And it's hard to predict what these environmental tolerances might be as the species moves in from its native range to its introduced range where the ecosystems don't exactly align. Um, so it makes it really difficult again for us to know which ecosystems might be affected and it could be that these warm, dry, or these cold, moist ecosystems, while being resistant to cheatgrass, are susceptible to a new invasive species with different traits. And that's kind of exactly what we're seeing happening in the Blue Mountain ecoregion, where this new invader, Vincenata dubia, um, this annual grass with a very shallow root system, it's kind of this tiny, flimsy thing, but seems to be, hev it's heavily invading this region and seems to kind of fit that um, ecological niche. So it's able to survive here where other invasive grasses seem not to be able to do so well. So just a little bit of background on Mentanata. Um, it's native to the Eurasia region and it was introduced to the border of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho in the 1950s and has since spread across these states and provinces um, and has become problematic in agricultural areas, especially in the Pacific Northwest, and is also becoming an issue in natural areas. 
And one of the areas that Ventanada is most heavily impacting are these rocky forest openings we call scablands in the Pacific Northwest. And so this is kind of reminiscent of that Great Basin ecosystem, um, but a little toned down. We have smaller sagebrush here, low, we call this low sage or stiff sage, still a lot of bare ground. The bunch grasses are smaller. Um, so you can imagine a fire here, if a fire was started here, it wouldn't spread very easily. There's not a lot of fuel to carry that fire. So we call these fire resistant ecosystems. Um, just like cheatgrass and the, and the big sage ecosystems, Ventanata has significantly increased fuels here in, the, um, in these scab lands <clears throat> where it's carp creating the carpet of that fine grassy fuel in the understory of these sagebrush. So if you were to get fire in this ecosystem now, like the cheatgrass, the Ventanata kind of acts as that conveyor belt, allowing fire to burn across the shrubs and into the surrounding forested areas, as well as burning any kind of um, stringer trees and juniper that might have been growing in that, in that ecosystem. So why should we care about the scablands? Um, one reason is because they host a wide variety of, um, a big amount of biodiversity including many rare and endemic species and First Nation foods. They also provide habitat to rare animals like sage grouse and provide winter foraging grounds for elk and deer. Another really important role these scablands play is in fire management. Um, so I'm gonna show you a short video here of a friend um, smoke jumping to access a nearby wildfire. What I want you to pay attention to here is the fire they're going to access and where it's burning. So you can see this fire is burning right at the edge of the forest scablin boundary. Although it's burning in the forest where there are abundant fuels, it hasn't crossed into the scablin. And that's because these areas act as kind of a natural fire break. And they're really important for fire managers um, to access fires, to act as firefighter and smoke jumper safe spots and landing zones, and to kind of, um, understand how fire is gonna burn across the landscape if they know that these scab lands aren't gonna carry fire that can alter their management strategy. And again, you can see that lots of bare ground here, scattered shrubs, not invaded, so probably not a great source. Um, probably not, the fire's not gonna to spread too easily across this scab land. So what can we do about the invasion? Um, there's a couple things. The first um, is that the first thing to know is that control costs and efforts increase as the area infested increases, which makes can which makes doing something which makes managing invasions really difficult. We're kind of past the eradication stage here for Ventanata. Um, it's already so widespread; it'd be really difficult to eradicate. Not impossible, very difficult with the tools we have available right now. So that puts us here kind of in the containment phase. It seems like Bensonata is still spreading, meaning it hasn't met its whole, hasn't met its um, environmental potential yet. So there's the opportunity to kind of contain it to where it is right now and hopefully stop the spread into new areas where it can have additional impacts. But in order to contain it to where it is now, we first need to know where it is. We also need to know what areas are likely to be invaded next. So what areas might be most susceptible and it's helpful to know what kind of impacts it's having. And that's kind of where my research comes in. So I'm gonna ask three questions today. The first is, what are the drivers of the Ventanata invasion? What are those environments that it grows in or doesn't it grow? The second question is, how might these areas differ from other invaders? How might these drivers differ from other invaders? So we've been making this comparison between Ventanata and cheatgrass. We've already seen that it um, tends to grow in the Scablin ecoregion where cheatgrass wasn't growing before, but are there other areas that Ventanata invades? Um, or are its impacts kind of just overlapping with other invaders like cheatgrass in the region? And my third question is what are kind of what are the impacts or the potential impacts? So how are the community composition and structure influenced by invasion and fire? So to answer these questions, I sampled seven recently burned areas across Eastern Oregon, starting in around Madras and ending up in Baker City. Um, these fires burned between 2014 and 2017. And I sampled things like fire severity. I measured the um, environmental characteristics like the topography and geology. I also measured 
um, the vegetation, such as canopy cover. I recorded every species present at the plots and their abundances um, and the ground cover, and of course, measured bentonata abundance at each of these sites. So we're gonna dive into some results here. And first I'm gonna talk about that question number one, the environmental drivers. Before I get there, there's a couple graphs I wanna explain. So we have these graphs, um, these ordination graphs, and you can kind of ignore the axes for now. They're not that important. What is important to know is that the, the points on this graph indicate my sample plots and sample plots that are closer together on the graph indicate plots that are more similar in species composition. So this is a lot, but we're gonna break it down. Um, starting with our big sagebrush sites. This is like that first picture we saw, the big sagebrush and the cheatgrass. Um, those are our red diamonds, indicating sites with a similar species composition, driven really by this big sagebrush in the overstory. Then we have juniper plots. Um, so here we have Western juniper woodlands. They're kind of open woodland plots, mostly juniper, some ponderosa pine. They kind of varied in understory, which made them spread out across the graph. And our open ponderosa pine and mixed conifer forests. And finally, those blue squares indicate our scavlin plots. So now on top of those communities, um, or on top of those plots, we're gonna lay, I'm gonna lay these environmental drivers. And those will kind of give us an idea of what are the environmental drivers um, driving those different plant community types. So now we can put some, a little bit of a title on our axis. So axis one um, is gonna represent increasing from sandstone and sandier soils with more bare ground to rockier soils that are more basalt driven. And axis two shows um, an increase in canopy cover um, a and a decrease in temperature with increasing elevation. So we have more kind of scavlin plots on rockier soils at higher temperatures, lower elevations, and more forest plots with higher canopy uh, on a mix of sandy and rocky soils. Axis three represents this gradient oops, of increasing burn severity and disturbance. So as you move up on axis three, we're getting higher burn severity. So now on top of that environmental plot with our community compositions, I've laid this heat map of Ventanata. And so what this shows is the plots with the highest amount of Ventanata cover. They're in the deepest red and the lowest amount of Ventanata cover, mostly no Ventanata cover here in the green and light yellows. Um, and so here we see that Bentonata most heavily invades these rocky areas um, with basaltic soils that are mostly scab land, open juniper, and forest sites. And on axis three, we're seeing Bentonata occurring in burned forests, juniper, and scab land sites. But also, although it's really red up here, we're seeing a lot of red down here too. So, so high severity burns, some low severity burns, and probably a lot of unburned plots as well. So here's a picture of Ensenada inv heavily invading this burn forest. All this green in the understory is that Ensenada. So to answer question one, we found that Ventanata is associated with unburned and burned forests, woodlands, and scablands with those rocky basaltic soils. And so that's great to know, um, but what we really kind of want to know is how does this differ from other invaders in the area? And so what I've done here is I've taken that heat map and I've repeated it for two other invasive annual grasses, one of them being cheatgrass we're familiar with, the other one medusa head, um, also common in the, across the region and also problematic. And I've taken um, the reddest area, so the top 20% of the, of the heat map, um, the plots with the top 20% of the Ventanata abundance, and I've done, um, and I've drawn a circle around that for each species. So the red representing Ventanata, the yellow cheatgrass, <clears throat> and the blue medusa hen. And what we can focus on now is the where these circles, where these polygons kind of overlap. So we're not seeing a whole lot of overlap between Ventanata and cheatgrass, except for here in this middle region. So cheatgrass seems to be driven more um, by sandy soils and bare ground and occurs more in open forests. 
um, with low canopy cover, kind of moderate canopy cover, then bentonata, which also occurs in those forests, but more on the rocky soils and can occur in more of these hot, dry areas where it overlaps with Medusa head. But unlike Medusa, unlike bentonata, Medusa head is pretty much restricted to the hottest, driest, lowest elevation of those plots of those scab lands. And on axis three, we're seeing a lot of overlap here in the high severity. So in our most severely burned forest and juniper um, woodland plots, we're seeing a mix of all three annual grasses. So in these instances, bentonata is probably not um, increasing that overall footprint as much as it is here in this area where you're not seeing overlap with the other two grasses, um, where bentonata is occurring in these less severely burned areas. So this plot tells me that Vencinata is probably increasing the invasion footprint and those subsequent impacts that annual grasses can have. So on to question three, how are the community composition and structure influenced by invasion and fire? Um, first, we're gonna look at how Vencinata relates to species diversity or the number of species present in each plot. And on this graph, we have um, on the x-axis, Vencinata increasing in cover, and on the y-axis, species richness, the number of species increasing. What we see is that in unburned plots, so here we're just looking at the unburned areas, Vencinata doesn't have a strong effect on native species richness, and it has a slightly positive effect on non-native species richness indicating that either Vincenata likes to grow in areas where there are lots of non-native species, or um, it may kind of promote these non-native species somehow. But it's a different story when we looked at the burned areas. Um, so here we see a strong negative relationship between native species richness and Vincenata cover in the burn plots, and not much of a relationship between non-native richness and Vincenata cover in the burn plots. So this indicates to me that there's something going on here, that in the unburned plots, Vincenata is not having much of an effect, and in the burned areas, Vincenata might be having a strong effect on species richness. And so one reason for that could be that if this was a plot and these shapes and colors were different species, um, when there's no Vincenata, it looks kind of like this. When Vincenata is introduced, we haven't, we've added the species Vincenata, but we haven't removed any of these other species, indicating that perhaps Vincenata is just growing um, and it's filling in these gaps. It's able to kind of tap into these potentially unused resources with a, this, um, a different trait perhaps that the native species don't have. And it's not really impacting their growth, at least in the short term, but um, it's still like, it's existing there, it's invading there. But if a fire occurs, and we go to kind of ground zero, we burned up everything on the ground, and Vincenata grows up now, um, now it could be that kind of one of two things is happening. Either Vincenata is kind of out competing these species for um, those resources that are available after the fire, maybe much growing much faster than the native species after fire, or more adapted to use those resources. Um, or these native species just really aren't adapted to fire at all because they grow in these fire resistant ecosystems and did not evolve with frequent fire. And so it could be they just take much longer to come back after fire, or maybe they don't have the seed source necessary to reseed these areas after fire. And that would cause that diversity to decrease. Kind of the final option is that Vincenata is just growing in areas after fire where there are fewer native species. So instead of kind of a causal relationship, we're just looking at a correlative relationship here where Vincenata, instead of causing the decrease in um, diversity in burned areas, is just simply growing in areas that are less diverse to begin with. So my inclination is that burning um, may increase the impacts of Ensenada on native species richness. Now I wanna break it down. We talked about the number of species on a plot, but we wanna kind of talk about what do those, what are those species roles, their functional groups. Um, and so I've broken those species down into six groups. We have annual forbs, annual grasses, invasive species, perennial forbs, perennial grasses and shrubs. And these invasive or non-native species are mostly annuals in this area. 
And this graph here is going to show um, a dot for each for each functional group correlated um, with associated with um, an increase, a 10% increase in Bensonata cover. So if annual Forbes was positioned here at the 1.1 line, that would indicate that there's a 10% increase on average in annual Forbes or a 10% increase in Bensonata cover. So now looking at the real data, um, what we see here is kind of similar to our species richness plot. There's not a very strong relationship with functional group cover and Bensonata cover. But when we add the burn plots, uh, it tells a little bit of a different story. So here, just focusing on the perennials, we see a slight decrease in cover with increasing Bensonata cover. But for the most part, these are really closely related. And this indicates to me that these species might be um, conveying some resistance to plots where they're present. So there could be, if there are more perennial forbs at a site, that might be deterring Bensonata from invading there or preventing it from invading there by using up those resources or just using up the space available. But on the other hand, where these annual species are present, or annual forms, annual grasses, and our exotic species, which are primarily annual, we see um, a big decrease from our unburned to our burned plots. So while they are mostly on, on average positively associated with Bensonata and unburned plots, but at a, or pretty variable in the burn plots, we're seeing all negative associations. And this indicates that we're kind of looking at that, that previous figure where Bentonata is growing in the gaps in the unburned areas, not really impacting the species cover, but in the burned areas, it might be out competing them or coming in faster and then out competing them, but somehow it's kind of impacting the species in the burn sites. And our final situation is with our shrubs here. Um, where we have um, also an increase in, or kind of a more negative association with Bentonata in the burn plots. Um, but this one indicates to me more that we're just losing shrubs from the ecosystem. It's kind of unlikely to me that Bentonata would be able to you know, outcompete a whole fully established shrub. So probably these are these are burning in the fire um, where Bentonata is present. And um, they're establishing very slowly after fire or not establishing at all because we saw very few seedlings as well. But that cover is going to be vastly reduced when you lose a large shrub on the landscape opposed to you know, a small annual form. So just like with species richness, um, but here we're seeing that burning may increase the impacts of Bentonata on functional group cover. So those are my three questions, and I just want to go kind of sum up the ecological implications of this study. Our first takeaway is that Bensonata is invading this novel niche, um, mostly in those scablands, but also in those unburned open forests and woodlands, that increases the overall invasion footprint and increases the overall um, impacts of those invasive species. While it's associated with burned areas, it doesn't require fire to invade. So we're seeing it heavily invading unburned areas as well as burned areas, which means that um, even an unburned landscape could be really susceptible to invasion. It could alter fire behavior in previously fire resistant communities like the scablands. It was correlated with lower richness shrub and forb cover in burned areas. And that signified that fire may intensify invasion impacts. So I want to briefly go through some management implications of this study. Um, the first being that we might just need to reconsider fire management strategies and safety zones if these areas that used to serve as natural fire breaks are now invaded and carrying fire. Um, it could be that prescribed fire alone may not be an effective control strategy and may cause unintentional impacts when bentonata is present. Um, prescribed fire can be used to control a lot of native, non-native species effectively. And it could be that it, it does for Bensonata as well, but um, because the study was just looking at wildfires, mostly in the late summer, it could be that a different season, like an early spring fire could have an effect on Bensonata, but would definitely, um, the study would suggest that a late season prescribed fire would, um, may have unintended consequences for Bensonata and native species. We also saw Bentonata may require different control strategies because it grows in these different environments. 
and that those annual species, because of their positive association unburned plots, may indicate sites at high risk for invasion. And perennials may increase invasion resistance because of that negative association in the unburned and burned plots. So it could be that sites with lots of perennials um, might indicate an area that's more resistant to invasion. This could also help us if we're trying to restore a site that's already invaded. It might be we want to plant more perennials if they help confer more resistance. So where are we going next with this study? Uh, we have kind of a big group of folks thinking about landscape implications of Ventanata. Here's an aerial photo of the Ochico National Forest, which is where a lot of our research took place. Um, it's pretty easy to see from space the, the patchwork of scablands and forests in this area. And it's not hard to imagine that if these areas were previously uninvaded and stopping fire and now become invaded and start carrying fire, that this could have landscape level effects on fire and across this area. So we'll be modeling that landscape fire with invasion across the Blue Mountain Eco region. That's this um, polygon here. And to do that, we've mapped the, the invasion across the eco region, as well as those, those pyro resistant or fire resistant um, ecosystems, mostly the scablands, but some similar areas that are thought to not carry fire without invasion. And we'll kind of lay those on top of each other and alter fuels according to the invasion which will allow us to model what fire might do across this landscape with invasion um, and without invasion and maybe under even a severe invasion scenario. And that's all I have for you all. Thanks so much for attending, um, for your attention and I'll take your questions. Thank you, Claire. That was, that was a lot to think about. <laughs> uh, you can unshare your screen, I think. Thank you. That's great. Um, we do have a, a few questions that that people have sent in, and I have some myself. Uh, uh, one of which is, uh, in terms of other factors that might help explain the spread of of invasives, especially ventanata, uh, but cheatgrass and medusa head as well. Uh, are you looking at at climate and grazing, cattle grazing, in in both of these in, in these areas? So I am not personally looking at climate or cattle grazing, but there are folks on our team that are doing both. Um, there has been a study that's looked at cattle grazing. Um, it's kind of a muddy study because <laughs> um, there is also a lot of elk grazing in the area and they're much harder to exclude. So the results from that are kind of inconclusive, but I can tell you that um, most of the landowners we talk to will say that their cattle will avoid eating bensonata. Um, some say that they'll eat it at certain times of the year, but it's pretty unpalatable as far as we know, um, unless you kind of turn it up and turn it into pellets and then cows might eat it. So it's likely that when it's present on the landscape, the cattle are going to avoid eating bensonata, eat it as kind of a last resort because it's this wiry thin grass that doesn't have a lot of nutrients, kind of hard to eat. Um, as far as the climate goes, that modeling piece I was talking about, um, about at the end, we'll also have a climate, um, kind of a climate chapter. So it'll be kind of the today chapter, and then we'll we'll model that same effect of Ensenada of the invasion on fire and kind of a projected future climate. Okay, thank you. Uh, is the blue, you mentioned that the Blue Mountain region, as an as an eco region, has been somewhat resistant to cheatgrass invasion. Is it also resistant to Ventanata? Uh, it's not. So that's what we're finding is that it's it's resistant to cheatgrass, but it's not resistant to Ventanata. Probably because, I mean, Ventanata might have this other suite of traits or it's just able to survive at slightly colder temperatures or have a slightly different root system, but really for reasons completely unknown. Um, cheatgrass and other annual grasses like Medusa head are present in the ecoregion at low abundances and they will heavily invade a burned forest um, in some cases but they're not invading those scab lands. So we're finding that there's, you know, Vencinata is really increasing that, that annual grass footprint instead of overlapping. Yeah, yeah. Are there restoration scenarios that are being developed to control Ventanata, not to mention Medusa head and cheatgrass, <laughs> which have been around for a long time, but, but it seems like restoration is gonna be necessary as these plants continue to proliferate. 
Yeah, so I can't speak to that um, too much. I could say that Bensonata is still really new. We only added it to the Oregon noxious species list just last fall. Um, so it's it's rapidly expanding. It definitely restoration would be great. <laughs> we don't. We're still in the very early stages of research to understand kind of what would be the best restoration management strategies. But there are managers that are trying things, um, trying different herbicide applications, and to to try to get it under control, but yeah. 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 difficult. <laughs> Does it change the severity of the fires that do occur in these That's areas? That's also something we're looking into. So severity is kind of an interesting topic, but um, so in the scablands, I guess you could say that it's increasing severity because prior to Ventanada, there was no fire and now there's fire and the fire is burning the shrubs which is kind of the only overstory species. So I would call that a high severity fire, You're kind of losing all the vegetation on the landscape when if, when a fully invaded scablin burns. But in the forest, it's more complicated. Um, we don't really know, like likely if there was just Bensonata in an understory and not a lot of woody fuels, um, probably just have a low severity fire in that forest. But if you saw like in the picture of the fire burning adjacent or the, the video we watched of the fire in the forest burning adjacent to the scab land that was uninvaded. It could promote high severity fire if those invaded scab lands act as kind of a fire conveyor belt and carry fire from one, um, let's say, fuel loaded forest to the next fuel loaded forest that might not have burned if the scab land wasn't invaded. So perhaps prescribed fires might, and, and other techniques for reducing fuel loads might be useful for, if I'm hearing you correctly, reducing invasive uh, abundance, ventanata, cheatgrass, and others, as well as reducing severity of the fires that will and do occur in these areas. It could be. It's it's really tricky because a lot of our fuel reduction methods are focused on reducing woody fuels, which do carry. I mean, they are they do promote a lot of the severe fires, those extra woody fuels in the understory. Um, but a lot of those same fuel reduction methods also exacerbate invasions because um, we're in, in there either burning, which we've seen can promote invasions, or um, cutting and dragging logs. There's a lot of understory disturbance, which a lot of invasive species, which promotes a lot of invasive species. So it can be challenging, I think, um, like woody fuel reduction following up with an understory fuel reduction, like a herbicide spray um, could be a good alternative, but there's a lot of downsides to herbicide too. So uh, it's kind of, what do you want to manage for? What kind of fire do you want? What are your goals? Um, mm -hmm. Is your goal to restore a, um, a diverse understory community? Or is your goal to to reduce high severity fire? Or, you know, is there a mix of things? Okay. That's yeah. complicated. <laughs> yeah, as, as, as all these questions become, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, does sagebrush, restoration in your experience or have you, know, have you talked with people who are active in restoring sagebrush communities does sagebrush restoration have an impact on ventanata abundance or or success or lack of success in in new landscapes you know where so i'm not i don't do that much work in the big sagebrush where a lot of that restoration work is being done there's also not right now that not that much ventanata in the big sagebrush it is um, it is expanding there, it has been reported there. There are areas that are heavily invaded, but where we, like the pictures I was showing of that low sagebrush um, is where kind of the front of the invasion is right now. And as far as I know, there's not, I don't know of any work that's being done to restore scab land sagebrush. Okay. Um, but yeah, in the big sage, I don't know what the impacts on Bensonata would be. Yep, yep. Um, a, a question of a, of a different sort here for students who might be watching your talk and thinking this is pretty cool and they'd like to like to get involved in this and pursue this perhaps as you are doing. Uh, how would you recommend they prepare? I'm thinking high school students. What do they need to do to get to get their foot in the door to do this kind of work? For high school students? Yeah, yeah. Um, what should they be looking at or studying or what sort of volunteer activities perhaps might they engage in or? I guess there's always, there's always opportunities to volunteer um, on restoration projects and sometimes collecting on research projects. 
but I think just studying something in the natural sciences, it doesn't have to be all that specific. Like I would say take a lot of math. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Biology. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, you need your statistics and then, and then it's more, more focusing on what you're interested in grad school. I think. <laughs> we have another question that relates to the uh, response of the fire management community to burns that ignitions that do occur on the landscape. Uh, does the presence of invasives change the calculus in your in your experience, or should it, uh, if it's not, uh, to the decision to let a fire burn versus? No, we need to put all fires out, which has been largely our practice, but that's changing now. Yeah, I think that's a difficult one too. I think again, it comes down to your goals. Like if your goal was to prevent spread of Ventanata and areas are burning that are invaded, um, or if your goal is to you know promote diversity in that area, then I'd say you might want to put it out. But there's so much more to an ecosystem than one invasive grass, so yeah, <laughs> I think yeah, it really comes down to those goals. Okay, uh, one final question here. I think it's final. We'll see if more come in. But uh, one person was wondering if you're aware if anybody at OSU had looked at the Chip Ross fire of 2014. That was a big event for Corvallis, of course, because it, it was close to to homes. Uh, did anybody look at that fire, perhaps with a lie on on the, the plant communities that were that you know that were where it occurred? You know, I'm not sure if anyone's done research out there. I've spent a lot of time in that burned area and can tell you there are a lot of invasive species, including Pentanata, um, in that in that Chip Ross burn. Um, but whether or not if someone studied it, I'm not sure. It's been something I've it's been like a pet project of something I've really wanted to do is install some plots out there and monitor invasives and chip rust, but we'll That's, see. <laughs> but for like a could, PhD student. <laughs> or it could be an interesting citizen science project. If, yeah, if you really, yeah. You gather some interesting great. people who wanted to learn more about that. Yeah, if you're um, into iNaturalists and you see grasses yeah. out there, take a picture. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, listen, that gets close to the, uh, the what we have time for tonight. I wanna thank you very much again for being such a good presenter for us Thank and sharing your knowledge and share your work. Uh, it sounds like you need an army to do <laughs> yeah. that kind of work with all the plots that you're, you and your, your colleagues are looking at. Uh, uh, so I wanna tell the uh, audience, please check out davincidays.org again for, uh, for events such as the Sidewalk Chalk Art Challenge and the upcoming music series that will be uh, starting off toward the, uh, toward the end of August. Uh, there are some uh, local musicians who are not living here, but people who grew up here uh, who are on the on the agenda for that uh, that series. That's going to be a lot of fun. Also on Tuesday nights, uh, we're calling this Tuesdays with Leo online. Uh, and I want to thank you all for being here. And again, thank our sponsors. And uh, next week, we'll be back here uh, for the final uh, STEAM lecture series with uh, Eduardo Cortilla Sanchez, who's going to be talking about renewable energy and the grid how the renewable sources such as wind and solar, uh, are, are they compatible with the grid that serves us and, and that we know uh, and love when it works and hate when it doesn't. So listen, have a good night, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening and see you next week. Thanks a lot. And thanks again, Claire. Good night. Thank you.